And the way that you're arguing today, both of you, and it, this is part of your vision that you've uh, argued and explained for years, that we can be a renewable superpower, but you're saying that we shouldn't try and compete with, say, Biden's approach, that we need to have our own approach. Yeah, yeah. B Biden's, they call it the Inflation Reduction Act, it's a funny name, really, because uh, uh, it's hard to see how it'll actually reduce inflation. Uh, it, it's based on two things that we can't have in Australia, huge budget deficits. The biggest, America now has got the biggest budget deficits ever had in peacetime. Uh, they can fund that because they're the world reserve currency. We would ruin the Australian economy if we had anything like that. Uh, and it's based on protection. They, they're giving huge support for, um, uh, for, for, for electric vehicles, for uh, green industry, but it's got to be made in America. You don't get that seven and a half thousand bucks US if uh, if your if your car's made in Japan or Germany or or, or China, uh, and protectionism doesn't work for us. Uh, uh, given our opportunities, given our size, given our place in the world, we've got to be an export economy. We always have been. When we've done well, that's where our growth has come from. It can come from there again, but not through protection. It's got to be support for the. The, the countries that rely on the world. And, and to focus on our strengths, and in terms of government policy, you're saying they need to focus on their strengths and as a, in, in terms of these exports, to have things like green metal um, powered via and, ma and made via the source of hydrogen power, and that then we could export to the region, export to Europe without tariffs. Uh, that's right. Well, Europe from 26 is going to have something they call the carbon ad adjustment border mechanism. It'll be a tax on any imports that have got carbon in them. So if you try to export steel or aluminium uh, made from coal to Europe, that'll, that'll, that'll put a huge import tax on it. Well, we won't get that uh, if, if we meet two conditions. One, uh, our product uh, doesn't have carbon in the supply chain. It's made from renewable electricity and renewable hydrogen. Uh, and if we've got similar taxes on the, everything in the supply chain or similar charges, and, 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 the, and we're suggesting a, a, a carbon levy, which is not a tax, but it would be acceptable in Europe as being equivalent. So we'd get free entry. Our competitors if their mugs won't do what we're doing uh, and we'll pay a big uh, border adjustment. So uh, we'll be in a very strong position to take that market. And, and I guess the, the beauty of what you are arguing with the Superpower Institute is that you don't have to grapple with the complexity of exporting hydrogen, which is a diabolical That's right. You don't have... The, the, the whole point of what we're saying really is that whereas previously it made sense to export iron ore, export metallurgical coal, export the gas and let the iron metal be made overseas. But when you're trying to do it, make green metal, you need hydrogen, you need renewable energy. Both of those are very difficult and very expensive to export. So it makes sense. The economics flip completely. It makes sense now to make the iron metal in Australia. So this is why this is such a benefit to the Australian economy we're going to bring a lot more value-added processing because that makes economic sense. And, and you're, you're also arguing in the, in the speech today that government needs to focus, as I said to Professor Garno, on what it can do. And one of the things is transmission. And here on, on my program and elsewhere, we've been de debating a lot this issue yeah. of not in my backyard. People don't want transmission lines through their farms. How do you grapple with that in terms of your prescription today? It doesn't really affect our prescription today because you can have the transmission lines in the Pilbara, the Spencer Gulf, up north. Most of what we're talking about will be done in the upper half of Australia where the solar potential is, is, is excellent. There's very few farms up there. So the problem you've got with the East Coast grid and the NIMBY factor uh, I mean, it'd be great if some of those people wanted to have some of these industries there, but if they don't, in many ways, the logical place for them is, as I say, in the Pilbara where the iron ore is, North Queensland, Western Australia where the bauxite is, um, up north where the best solar resources are. So it's just not an issue for the superpower industries. And how do you get the dollars into it? How do you get the investment into it? How do we drive that? There's... 
three ways we drive the investment. One is to make sure that we get access to initially the European carbon border adjustment mechanism. If you're taxing, uh, for example, metal, iron metal made from fossil fuels, uh, but you're not taxing the green metal, the green metal will be cheaper in Europe than the fossil fuel metal. So we need access there. The second thing we need is an innovation grant. We're calling it the Superpower Investment Innovation Scheme. We need that because this is such a major transition. All the technologies are doable, but they've not been done at scale. And so when we do them at scale, the initial people are going to learn a lot, which will help everybody else. So we really need to give an incentive for that innovation and we need government to build some of the transmission infrastructure. OK, so there's the, there's the roadmap. Part of it is, as Professor Garner, you touched on this levy, and, and looking at your speeches and knowing the history of this country, uh, the, 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 the ups and downs and mostly downs of the energy debate in this country over the last decade or two, a levy on the polluters to make them pay for the cost they impose on others, that looks like the most glaring difficulty in this argument. How do, how do, how do you win that debate? Oh, we, we don't pretend that everyone will put up their hands and say, uh, go as fast as you can. Certainly the 105 uh, <coughs> companies that will be uh, paying that levy uh, within Australia uh, won't think it's a great idea, um, but there's uh, uh, 27 million Australians who will do, do very well out of it, a lower cost of living, more jobs, higher real wages, and in the end, you've got to make choices. We've made some bad choices in the last 10 years. I wrote, uh, wrote a book, uh, uh, Reset, in the middle of the pandemic, which pointed out that we've, uh, since 2013, we've had the, uh, just about the worst growth in average output, output per person in the developed world. We, in the two decades before that, we had nearly the best, so it was quite a coming down. Uh, real wages are lower now than 10 years ago. That's never happened in Australia before. So you say it's impossible to put a levy on 105 uh, uh, gas and coal producers. I tell you what, it's impossible for the Australian community to accept another decade of no growth in real wages. Uh, so we're, we've got to take, make choices. Uh, and in the end, yes, it will be impossible to impose a levy because the polluters won't like it, but it's more impossible to look 27 million Australians in the face and say you're going to have another two decades of stagnant living standards like the last decade. Ross Garno, Rod Sims, it's wonderful to have you here and to get your insights. Very much appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Karen. Great, great talking to you, Karen.